It was he who gave some to the apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth and love, we will in all things grow up in him who is the head, that is Christ. For him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, and in each part does its work. Let's read this together, shall we? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to look at these, the sections of this creed that has, has guided Christians through the centuries. And thank you, Lord, uh, for your word, which guides and teaches us as the church, as the body of believers. And I just pray, Lord, that you would, by your spirit, give us insight, that you would show us something maybe that this morning that we've never thought of before that we could look at things in a whole new way. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time. It's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Today we continue our look at the Apostles' Creed by looking at what it means to be a church. What does this thing called the church mean? And how is it supposed to impact and change my life? How is it supposed to impact the world around me? Now, I know we've recited the creed, when I remember, <laughs> for a number of weeks, and some of us might get tripped up over the use of the word Catholic. Notice it's in small c's. It had nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic used here is what it originally meant, meant which was universal the church universal. The church is something that is widespread. When we belong to the church, we belong to something worldwide, even something that includes those who have died in Christ before us. And even with a definition like that, we can still get tripped up a bit. Some of us see the church as simply the architectural structure. You know, that old building on the corner of Augusta and John Streets. Others see a specific church, like First Baptist Church, or maybe a denomination like the Convention Baptists. Some might even see the church as more of a, a social institution, something to belong to that looks good on a resume if you're going to run for office, or a place to go for ladies' teas or bazaars or scouts or guides. Some even see it as a, as a club that they have some sense of ownership over. They've been attending for 50 years, and if they have their way, the church will run exactly today as it was 50 years ago and exactly the same 50 years from now. We may not realize it if the church has been a big part of our lives over the years, but there is a shifting attitude in the world out there towards the church. The Barna Institute, which does all kinds of surveys in the States about the church and faith and society, found in a recent survey that Americans are pretty well split 50-50 on their view of the church. Half of it see it as something somewhat or very important, and half see it as not very important or not at all important. For those under 35, those are called millennials or Gen, Gen Z, only 20% say the church is very important, while 35% say it's not important at all. Yet there is still a recognition by most people in society that in the world that, that there is a spiritual need that they have. They just are increasingly thinking that the church can't meet it. 
There was a book that came out a few years ago with an interesting title. The title was, They Like Jesus, Just Not the Church. And those who are 35 and under are still spiritually open and even fascinated with Jesus. But many of them don't connect with the church or organized Christianity. And some of that is due to uh, their misconceptions about the church, but some of it is due to stuff that they have seen in the church that has turned them off from wanting anything to do with it. There was a study done in New Zealand a few years ago where they asked people who don't go to church, what's your perception of church and how come you don't go? And here are some of their answers. They said the church is not a spiritual place, which is a bit of a shock for those of us who are in it. That, but that even some churchgoers feel that way. Barna found in one survey that only 6% of churchgoers could say that they learned something about God the last time they were in church. I sure hope it's more than 6% here, but that's a bit of a stunning statistic. When asked about what helps them grow in their faith, churchgoers said reading the Bible, praying, uh, the influence of family. Going to church wasn't even on the top 10 of their list. People are spiritually hungry, but if church isn't found to be a spiritual place, people are going to look elsewhere to fill the void in their lives. The people in this study said that the church is stuck in the past, in a time when it had power and abused its control. Now, I think there are a lot of good churches out there that are not abusing their power or abusing their control, but even among those good churches, many of them are stuck in the past. And they're not finding ways to connect with people who are living in what is really a post-Christian world. Other people in this study said that they said the church and churches lacked integrity. They said free and independent thinkers don't need the church. They said they feel the church is oppressive and irrelevant. They said, this is one I've heard for generations, the church is only after their money. And for many of them, the response was, the church, who cares? Or to put it another way, the church, meh. It just wasn't on their radar. There's a lot of young people in the world today who they have not intentionally rejected church. It's just not on their radar. It's just not something they've even thought about or considered. It's just irrelevant. And that's the, the society that we as a church are living in. Even churchgoers have changed some of their attitudes towards church. Forty years ago, someone who was considered a regular church attender if you went at least three Sundays a month. Or for some, like I know for a few years when I was growing up, you'd go multiple times a week. You'd go to two church services on Sunday, youth group, choir practice, young adults group. Today, people define themselves as a regular church attender if they attend once a month. And if you talk to pastors and church leaders today, this shift in thinking has a profound effect on how churches do ministry and how pastors plan programs and plan ministries. The church is perceived in many different ways by many different people in many different cultures. But what does it mean when to say that I believe in the church? And as always, the place to, to go to discover what God is really trying to say is to go to the scriptures. And hopefully in the next 19 minutes and 46 seconds, we'll be able to clear away some of the clutter of society's perceptions and even our own preconceived ideas and, and get to the root of what the church is supposed to be. And for this message, I've been indebted to Millard Erickson and his big, thick book that I had to read in Bible college called Christian Theology. And so I'm using a basic outline that he used in his chapters on the church. And I'll be quoting him a number of times. I just won't be saying over and over again, Erickson said, Erickson said, because that will get dull. But just know that his fingerprints are all over this message. Erickson's definition of the church is this. The whole body of those who go through Christ, who, who, sorry, the whole body of those who through Christ's death have been savingly reconciled to God and have received new life. It includes all such persons, whether in heaven or on earth. While it is universal in nature, it finds expression in local groupings of believers, which display the same qualities as does the body of Christ as a whole. Now, Scripture provides three different biblical images of what the church is and how God intends the church to be. And the first is found in that song that I taught you earlier. The church is the people of God, the people of God. The last half of 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. 
you look casually through the Old Testament, you'll find all kinds of passages where God is telling his people of Israel, you will be my people and I will be your God. Church is meant to be a place of belonging. It's a place where we belong to God and where we learn to live out what that belonging to God means in our everyday lives. But it also means that God belongs to us. He takes pride in his children, his people. He protects and cares for his people. Church is meant to be a two-way relationship. God expects his people to be his people and not divide their loyalty among other things that will take God's place in our lives and be more important than God. But his people can also expect God to be there for them, to walk with them through every road in their lives, to care for them, and to watch over them as a loving father. The church is the people of God, people who belong to God, and people who have a God who will live with us and walk among us. Secondly, the church is referred to in Scripture as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. The church is the center of Christ's activity in the world today, just as his physical body was when he walked on earth. What Jesus did during his earthly life, he did through his physical hands and feet. What Jesus does on earth today and all through the centuries since his ascension, he does through the church, his body, his hands and his feet. The image of the church as the body of Christ emphasizes our connection with Christ as the head of that body. Colossians 1.18 says that Christ is the head of the body, the church. And what is it that's hidden inside our noggins? It's our brains. And it is our brains that, that in an amazing way direct all of our actions, all of our decisions, everything we think and everything we do. Since I'm doing ministry at the university at UOIT, I figured while I'm there, I might as well take a course and get educated. And so I signed up for a course in developmental psychology. Never took it before. And last Monday, we were talking about brain structure. And though it was just a quick introduction, it still struck me how utterly amazing the human brain is and how those billions of brain cells and synapses work together to make up who we are and, and what our bodies do. Christ is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. He's the brains of the outfit. It is he that guides and controls and directs those who have placed their trust in him and belong to him. It is only inasmuch as we're connected to the head, the brain, connected to Christ, that we as Christians, that we as a church, can live out Christ's work in the world and be his hands and his feet. The idea of the church being the body of Christ not only speaks to how we're connected to Jesus, the head, but also how we're connected to each other within the church. We are all interconnected. We need each other. We rely on each other. We depend on each other to fulfill what Jesus wants to do through his church and into the world. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all, of its, all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. There's no such thing as an isolated, solitary Christian. Now, I know Christians throughout the centuries have sometimes encountered situations where they're isolated, especially if they've been put into prison for their faith, which still happens in many countries around the world today. But that's not the norm. And I think in those situations, I think God gives those people an extra sense of his presence so they don't feel alone. But for the vast majority of Christians, we are meant to be connected to each other through this thing called the church. Connected as one part of the body is connected to another part. And in being connected, we mutually encourage each other and build each other up in the faith. The body of Christ is characterized by genuine fellowship and compassion and empathy. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, If one part suffers, every part of it suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. If you break an ankle, never broken an ankle, broken the bone of my foot, but, never broke, but if you break an ankle, the pain you will feel will be around your ankle. But in reality, you won't be feeling that great all over. It will affect every other part of your body. It will affect the functioning 
of the rest of your body. Your hands and your head may say, I want to go over there, but your ankle's like, no, I'm in pain, I can't make it over there. Or you'll go there a lot slower. As the body of Christ, we are interconnected. If one hurts, we all hurt, we all feel it. If one grieves, we all grieve. But if one rejoices, we all get to rejoice in their success without any resentment or jealousy. As we said before, the body of Christ is universal. Colossians 3.11 tells us, Here there is no Greek or Jew, uncircumcised or circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. There are no longer any special qualifications to be part of the church, like nationality or class or status in society. If you ever go to a very old church, I remember as in grade school, going on school field trips to Upper Canada Village in Morrisburg, Ontario, and this is kind of this, this town that's been built up from houses that they moved all over Ontario to, to create this town that was, would be like it would have been like in 1820, United Empire Loyalists' time. And there was this church there that had been rebuilt. And you notice there were certain spots, usually front and center, that had little plaques on the, on the pews. And these were pews or benches that the rich people in town had rented and bought, and they paid extra so that they had their spot in church every Sunday, and it was usually, usually front and center. Their riches and their status in society afforded them a special place in church. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. The body of Christ is universal and open to all who believe on him. Whosoever will may come, and whoever receives Christ and believes on his name, to them God gives the right to be called children of God. The church is the body of Christ, and as such, is an, exten is an extension of who he is, an extension of his ministry. Our whole purpose for being a church is to be part of the body of Christ, and to do what he would do if he was still physically here on earth. We are called to be his hands and his feet, to minister to this world the way that Jesus would, and to call people to him. When I first started youth pastoring, we used to wear these bracelets that said WWJD on it. What would Jesus do? And that's what the church is called to do, to do what Jesus would do if he was physically here on earth. Now, the third way scripture describes the church, we have the people of God, the body of Christ, and the third way is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God accomplishes his work on earth through the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity. It's the spirit that brought the church into being on the day of Pentecost. And it's the spirit that continues to draw people to Jesus. It's the spirit that continues to shine the searchlight, shine the flashlight on Jesus, guiding people towards salvation and into a, the community of belonging that is the church. It's the Holy Spirit that indwells the church on an individual and a collective basis. It's the Holy Spirit that is the lifeblood and the breath of the church. Without the Holy Spirit, we would just be a bunch of nice people who get together on Sunday and try to do nice things. It's the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. It's the Holy Spirit that brings life into the church. It's the Holy Spirit who births in us the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about last week. It's the Holy Spirit that changes us and makes us more like Jesus as we walk with him every day. And it is the Holy Spirit that gives power to the church. Jesus' last instructions to his disciples was not to do anything until the Holy Spirit came to give them the power to do it. In Acts 1a, Jesus tells them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It is the Spirit that empowers us as the church to be the extension of the ministry that God, that Christ has called the church to be. We cannot be the church in our own strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that brings unity within the church. Unity, not uniformity. We're not meant to be clones of each other. But rather it means a oneness of aim and a oneness of action. Our goal is the same. It's the goal of building God's kingdom, of spreading the gospel of Christ. But yet each expression of the body might have different ways of achieving that goal, depending on their context. It is the Spirit dwelling within us that makes us sensitive to the leading of the Lord. It's the indwelling Spirit that takes people like us who could be so set in our ways and sure of how we should do things and instead changes us so that we're responsive and obedient to the leading and the direction of the Lord. 
The Holy Spirit cleanses and purifies the church and makes it holy, makes us holy. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and as such we are not our own. We belong to him. We're bought with a price. And because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are to honor God in all we say and all we do. The people of God, the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is what Scripture tells us we are as the church. But what is it that the church is created to do in the world? Well, in general, the church is created to carry out the Lord's ministry in the world, to continue to do what he did and what he would be doing if he was still here in the flesh. But now we are his body, and there are things as a church that we are called to do. And Erickson talks about four main roles of the church in the world today. The first and most important is evangelism, to tell others about Jesus and give them the opportunity to invite him into their lives and become a part of the church as well. Evangelism is the last instruction that Jesus gave his disciples. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything Christ commanded them. And this work of evangelism is not to be done in our own strength. I know that left to our own devices, the overwhelming majority of us, myself included, would be too self-conscious and too afraid of rejection to ever share Jesus with anyone. But Jesus promises us, the very last verse in the book of Matthew, Matthew 28, 20, he says, Surely I am with you always even to the end of the age. Acts 1.8, which we read before, promises us that the Holy Spirit would give his disciples power to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And these name, the geographic places in this verse are not there by accident. They're there for a reason. Now, the gospel isn't just for the select few. It's all-inclusive for anyone who will come to Jesus. And it says, first, the gospel is shared in Jerusalem. That was the immediate vicinity of where the disciples live. So the church is called to reach out to their immediate surroundings, the place most easily within reach. Friends, family, people in the immediate community. But sometimes that place is the hardest to do the church's ministry. It's hardest to do Christ's ministry there because the people know us the best there. And they see us, warts and all. And it's easy for them to point in, on our bad days and say, hey, Christian, are you sure? Look what you're doing. So that can be a tough place to minister, but the Spirit gives us power to be witnesses, even to our closest friends and family. Then it says the gospel is shared in Judea. That's the place beyond Jerusalem, but a place that wasn't all that different culturally. So we as a church have a responsibility to think beyond our little world here and to envision how the church universal could be a ministry maybe throughout all of Ontario or all of Canada, and, and how we as First Baptist Church can be a part of that. Then the gospel is to be shared in Samaria. Now, the people of Samaria and Judea did not get along. They had a history, and it had a lot of conflict and a lot of drama. The Jewish people, if they had to go from here to here and Samaria was in the middle, they would inconvenience, inconvenience themselves and take the long way around just to avoid walking through Samaria. Samaria represents, for us, the people who are the least like us, the people who might be hard to love, the people who might be least receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Geographically, for us in Canada, I often think of Samaria as Quebec. Or Samaria might be a Muslim country where Christianity and the church are illegal. Or Samaria might be a different generation than our own that we rub shoulders with every day in Port Hope, but we really can't understand them or even relate to them. But the Holy Spirit gives us the power, gives the church the power to be a witness, even in Samaria. And then Acts 1a tells us that the church is to be witnesses to the end of the world. The message of the gospel spreads in ever-widening circles as the church sends people with a mission and with a passion for maybe a certain people group or a certain country to go and represent us and be the body of Christ reaching out to people on the other side of the world. That's why when I always pray for our offering, I always pray that God would use the money we give to spread his gospel in Port Hope through us, 
in Canada through Christine and Youth for Christ that we support, and throughout the world through the Hawkins family at Trans World Radio, and through the Haddads at the Bible College in Lebanon. These are people that we are supporting financially. There's a little board back there that has their newsletters on it, talks about what they're doing. These are the people that we're sending as a church to go to the ends of the world. If the church is to be faithful to its Lord and bring joy to his heart, it must be engaged in bringing the gospel to all people. People we like and people we humanly dislike. People who are like us and people who are very different from us. The role of the church in evangelism is to share the gospel of Christ with all people. The church is created for evangelism, first of all, and secondly, the church is created for edification. The French word for a building is edifice. Edification means building something up, or in this case, building each other up within the church. Ephesians 4.12, part of what Amy read before, tells us that God has given the church many gifts to prepare God's people for work of, works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. Erickson maintains that the potential for edification is the criterion by which all activities of the church are to be measured. In other words, when we as a church try and decide, well, what events should we put on? What ministry should we be part of? What should we do as a church? The question we need to ask ourselves is, will this event, will this activity, will this ministry build up the church? Will it draw people into the church? Will it make those already in the church stronger in their faith? Will it help them feel like they belong more, feel like they're part of the community? Edification, building each other up in the faith, happens through fellowship, through relationships, through building relationships with each other in the unity of the Spirit, so that we share experiences, we, we share our burdens with each other, we, we might even share our possessions with those in need. Each of these is a biblical means of fellowship and of building up the church. Edification happens through instruction and teaching of the scriptures. This happens, yeah, on Sunday morning, but it also happens in your families as you teach your children and your grandchildren how to follow God in word and in deed. It happens between members of the church who might come together to read the Bible together or pray together or just talk about life together and what God is doing in your lives together in a way that would encourage each other and build each other up. And edification can happen through the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. Because God has given the church spiritual gifts that are listed in the Bible that are given by, to believers in order to encourage and comfort and build up the church. Our personal availability to God and someone else's deep need intersects at a point. And God, at that point, can give the believer something supernatural, something beyond anything that he or she could provide. And that will be a gift to the other person or a gift to the church as a whole to build them up in the faith and to encourage them in their walk with God. The church was created for evangelism, the church was created for edification, and the church was created for worship. For worship. The first two concentrates on people, outside the church and inside the church. Worship concentrates on the Lord. I was watching a video about worship the other day, and it talks about how we can be kind of self-focused sometimes in worship in the church. We can be focused on how, on how the church service, how the music or the sermon is making me feel. I was talking to one of my students who's in Bible college out in BC, and she said, I'm getting so frustrated. Some of the songs we sing, they're all about how I feel, rather than talking about singing songs that focus on who God is. And the bottom line is that when it comes to worship, it's not about us. It's about God but worshiping who he is. Erickson writes, In worship, the church centers its attention upon who and what God is, not upon itself. It aims at appropriately expressing who and what he is and not at satisfying its own feelings. We've come to look at worship in the church primarily through music, but in reality, that's only a small part of what the church is to do in worship. But in all things, worship means focusing on God and who he is not on ourselves. Part of worship as a church, as the body of Christ, as the people of God, is to meet for worship regularly. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage each other, 
It is so good for the people of God to be together. I look forward to every Sunday to come and be with all of you. And I look forward to every Wednesday to come and be with the young people, and many of whom are so faithful. Right, Kelina? So faithful to be there every single Wednesday. What's that verse about the young people being examples to the rest of the believers? I know life is busy, but I would challenge all of us to define the word regularly the way the verse in Hebrews spells it out. The church gathers together for edification and worship, and then it goes out in the power of the Spirit to touch the world through evangelism and, finally, through social concern. An important role of the church is social concern, acts of Christian love and compassion for both the believers and the unbelievers. Jesus in his earthly ministry cared about the problems of the needy and the suffering. And if the church is to be his body, be his hands and feet, and carry on his ministry, the church needs to be engaged in some sort of ministry to the needy and the suffering. The book of James is a part of the Bible that uh, really challenges readers in this area. In verse, chapter 1, verse 27, uh, James defines religion that God accepts as pure and faultless as A, looking after orphans and widows in their distress, and B, keeping oneself from being polluted by the world. The first one he mentions, looking after orphans, widows, the two most vulnerable sectors of society in that day. Later in chapter 2, James talks about those who claim to have faith but don't do anything about it. They respond to a person in need by saying to them, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed. But they don't do anything to actually meet the need. And James calls this types of faith without good works to go along with it. He calls it a dead faith. 1 John 3.18 instructs the church not to just love with words, but with actions and truth. The role of the church in social concern is to meet the practical needs of those in need. But it also involves speaking the truth. There are times in society where the greatest social concern the church can do is to speak out against unrighteousness or to speak out against injustice and to speak the truth of the gospel. The gospel. That's the crux of the entire matter. This is to be the root of everything the church does. Erickson writes, the one factor which gives shape to everything the church does the element which lies at the heart of all its functions is the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, it's found in the Apostles' Creed that we've been looking at for months. The gospel is the truth of Jesus Christ and what God has done through him. It is the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. He lived the life where he was fully human and fully God, the only 200% person to ever exist, that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again to life, and is coming again to judge the living and the dead. And in this gospel, we have a living hope, a hope for salvation for our souls, a hope for a restored relationship with our Creator, a hope to, to be, live the life and become the person that God always meant for us to be, and a hope for an inheritance in heaven that will never perish, never spoil, never fade. It is this hope of the gospel that is at the core of who we are as the church, as the people of God, as the body of Christ, as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we as a church are called to live out the gospel of Christ through evangelism, through edification, building each other up, through worship, and through social concern. We are called to serve the Lord and serve the world, not in the way that seems best to us, or the way we've always done it before, but in a way that honors God, in a way that responds to his leading and his direction as the head, the brains. We are to serve the Lord and the world in the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that meets real needs, both spiritual needs and physical needs that we see before us. We are the church, and we have been given a mission to honor God and glorify God, to build each other up, to share the gospel and Christ's love and compassion with others, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, an extension of his ministry, to make a difference in this world for him. So let us at First Baptist be about being the church and doing the work of the church. Would you pray with me, please?
Lord, thank you that you've given us the honor and privilege to be a part of the church. And because there's humans in the church, the church isn't perfect, and church makes mistakes. But you still have decided that you want to work through the church to minister to this world and to draw people to yourself. Help us, Lord, not to be too narrow in our view of the church and what it is. Help us to begin to see it as the body of Christ, the people of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to evangelize, to share our faith with others in ways that people will understand, both in word and in deed. Help us to edify and to build each other up and to encourage each other in the faith. Help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth and to lift you up, Lord, focusing all of our attention on you. Help us, Lord, to be concerned for those in need in the world around us. Lord, help us as a small church to be able to find a way to, to make a difference in, in some sector of our society that is in need and is suffering. Put something on our hearts that you're calling us to do that maybe no one else is able to do, to meet the, the needs of the world around us, both spiritually and physically. Lord, I pray that this church will always be a place where people will feel welcome. I pray that this church will always be a place where people can feel like they belong. I pray that this church will always be a community that encourages and lifts each other up. I pray that this church is, will always be a church that speaks the truth of the gospel of Christ. I pray that this church will always be a place where people will leave here having found out something new about you, found out something new about themselves, that they can grow and chew on and make a part of their lives with you. We commit this church to you, Lord. We can try and do things in our own strength and it ain't going to work. But Lord, I just pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would enable us to be what you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, to rely on you always. We just ask, Lord, for the blessing of your Holy Spirit upon who we are and that you would guide and lead us into what we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.